My name is Giselle and this is Slow Food Live. This is Slow Food Live happy hour because it's Friday and we all need this, I think. <laughs> so if you're here today, I hope you're somewhere comfortable um, or you're ready to get your bitters going and enjoy your weekend. Slow Food Live is our response to the need to stay at home and not being able to get together in the way that we have in the past and so much enjoy. And this is our way of bringing Slow Food into your home during this time. If you're not familiar with Slow Food, Slow Food is a global grassroots movement. We're present in 160 countries. Slow Food began 30 years ago in Italy, and we advocate for good, clean, and fair food for all which means a lot of things and we are in it for all of those things. So I am really, really excited to welcome back Kelly Dressman at Dryland Distillers. We did a session, another happy hour session with Dryland and the dry, Kelly and the Dryland team several weeks ago. And there was a lot of enthusiasm for Kelly teach, teaching us how to make bitters. So she has graciously offered up her time today to return to Slow Food Live and teach us how to make bitters. So Kelly, thank you so much for being here and I'm just gonna turn it right over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Giselle. Um, I'm Kelly Dressman from Dryland Distillers. We're a small craft distillery in Longmont, Colorado. Um, we try to make all of our spirits um, with slow spirit values, which go coincide with the slow food values. Um, and yeah, all of our spirits we try to make um, to, to help people experience the Western landscape. Um, we make two weeded whiskeys that are locally grown. The wheat is locally grown here and um, in a dry land fashion, like without irrigation. And then we have um, a Colorado native gin that has all Colorado native botanicals. And then we make a mezcal style spirit that is made with prickly pear cactus that's native to our state as well. Um, but today I am here to talk to you about bitters and um, I am kind of in charge of making sure that all of our bitters are up to date and then coming up with new recipes whenever we need new bitters for different cocktails in the tasting room. So um, first I'm gonna start off by giving like a little bit of a history of bitters. The first bitters were made in Egypt and basically what it was is just an herbal maceration in wine. Um, the alcohol within the wine would help draw out some of the medicinal properties of the herbs that they would put in there. And actually the majority of the bitters that we know today, like Angostura, Peixotes, <laughs> and, um, and other bitters that we use commonly in cocktails these days were originally patented, patented medicines. Um, so it's interesting, like the, the correlation that they have in the history of being um, herbal remedies for all sorts of different maladies. But basically, so from Egypt, then into the Middle Ages where distilled spirits were widely more available and that kind of coincided with the same, at the same time as um, an increase or like a renaissance in, in the study of herbal medicine, where they were trying to figure out what attributes of different plants uh, were um, medicinal for different digestive maladies, for other types of sicknesses that were happening um, in the time. So there was kind of like a, um, a a marrying of the two where they would put all of the different herbs into the distilled spirits and it would again the alcohol would draw out the different medicinal qualities of the herbs. Um, so then by the early 19th century um, herbal bitters in England were being added to canary wine with growing popularity and then in the Americas in 1806, the first definition of a cocktail was found. <laughs> and basically the first definition of a cocktail was um, any stimulating liquor that's comprised of any kind of spirit and then sugar, water, and bitters. So we see here like the, the um, 
bridging the gap between it being like a medicine or you know an herbal tonic that was taken only for maladies and then now it's being used for um for enjoyment in our cocktails and and um creating more depth of flavor in our spirit spirited drinks so from there um i just wanted to say like angostura was originally a digestive tonic that was for seasickness and then other digestive maladies for sailors and it's it, the recipe has gone through some changes over the years but um it's stuck pretty true to its original roots and so there's a lot of um you know herbal very beneficial um attributes to many of the bitters that we know today the same thing with Peixote. it was originally made by an apothecary named antoine amade Peixote in new orleans and now it's manufactured um, i think in kentucky but basically same thing like it was for digestive purposes and then you have like a, a whole um piece of bitters that are digestive bitters and they become like digestifs where you get um, and apertifs, which are, you know, your Amaro's um, where Campari comes in with the bittering agents there and all of that. So without further ado, we are going to start off with the celery bitters. So first things first, you're going to take one rib of celery. We're gonna cut it up into little pieces and add it to, if you have a jar, preferably a glass jar. If you don't have a glass jar, if you have like a stainless vessel or some sort of ceramic container that will also work, just something that, um, that will not, that's non-reactive. And having a tight fitting lid is ideal. So we'll just cut up the celery and we're going to add it to the jar. Oops. And my hands have been sanitized, but we're also going to be putting really high proof alcohol in here. So it's going to kill anything that I put on the And then you have one scallion and we're gonna do the same thing with that. Just cut it up. And we're gonna put it in. Yeah, so you guys can see what I'm doing. And we're going to give this a slight muddle, like nothing too crazy. But we just want to bruise the scallion and a little bit of the celery, just a little bit. Alrighty. So there's that. And then now we're going to add one tablespoon of the mustard seed and then one tablespoon of the celery seed and now two allspice berries very precise just two and stick it in there and then we're going to add the base spirit So this is our base spirit. Our base spirit is made um, out of the wheat mash that we distill. So it's the white Sonoran wheat and the Antero wheat that has um, gone through a mash and fermentation. And then this is just right off the still. So we're going to add six ounces or three quarters cup of a base spirit. You guys at home, I know you don't have 
the same amount of base spirit, but or the same kind of base spirit. But basically, any kind of vodka will work, um, preferably a higher proof if you have it. And we're going to do this. And um, I am not sure who said it, but yes, they were looking for uh, a lot of bitters recipes ask for bittering agents that are difficult to find like gentian root or cinchona bark. Um, and we do utilize those also in the tasting room. However, you can draw a lot of bitterness from things like celery seed has a decent amount of bitterness. Um, and then later on in the orange bitters, the pith that is present inside of the, um, the orange peel, also great bittering agent. So you can draw out the bitterness that you need for bitters in a number of different ways. So then you're just gonna shake it. And basically you're gonna let this sit for three weeks and shake it anytime you get the chance to um, and until it infuses into the alcohol and then you have bitters, you have celery bitters. And the celery bitters that we make here, we use for um, any number of cocktails. It's obvious uses are like a Bloody Mary um, to kind of add a little bit of spice or spunk to any kind of martini, especially if you like them dirty. Um, it adds great depth of flavor. Um, and if you're using a strong a gin with stronger botanicals, it'll stand up to the celery a little bit better. So um, yeah, and then gin and tonic, it adds a little bit to like a D&T. We in the tasting room here mostly use it with our rum, which is made in an agricole style. And what that means basically is that our rum is aged in fermentation over actual sugar cane. So it has like chopped up actual bits of the cane in there. Um, so it gets this beautiful like grassy earthy undertone to it. And the celery, because it has that the same kind of grassy notes, helps bring out the grassy notes that are already present in our rum. And we put them in like a daiquiri, for example, just one drop. Like uh, at the end of the three weeks, this will taste exactly like celery. And, and one drop will go a long way. So unless it's more of a savory cocktail, you would only need one drop to to balance out any sort of a sweet cocktail, sweet or sour cocktail. So there's celery. Um, and we'll open up to questions at the very end. So if you guys have questions about this particular recipe, like write them down. You can put them in the chat if you want to right now, just to, to keep them in queue. But we're gonna move on to the next round of bitters, the orange bitters, and then we'll like circle back around to all of those questions. So now, orange bitters. First, so for this one, you're gonna need the equivalent of two oranges worth of dried orange peel. If your orange peel is not dried, it is fine. But you wanna make sure that you get a decent amount of pith because we're making bitters right now. Um, I also make like vermouths are kind of a different other section of bitters um, that are wine-based, but we can't produce a wine-based vermouth here. We have to use spirits as the base. And when I'm making those, I mostly just use the zest and not as much the pith. But here you want to use the pith because it is the main bittering agent in this recipe. So you'll have the pith. And so if you are peeling your orange right now, you want to make sure that you're getting a lot of that white, good, bitter pith. So. So there's the orange peel. And how we oven dry ours is we line it on cookie sheets and we put it in the oven for three hours and we turn it and mix it up halfway through at about 170 degrees. All right, and now we are going to add five whole cloves. Cloves go, a little goes a long way with cloves. Like you don't wanna overdo it with the clove. 
but a little bit is nice. So just five cloves. And then five allspice berries. One, two, three, four, five. And now we're going to do a tablespoon of whole coriander. And coriander, I mean, it's, there's a reason why it's so present in Mexican cuisine. Just how it goes with citrus is an, an amazing um, marrying of flavors. And so there's a lot of coriander in our orange bitters. And, it, and like what it draws out in a whiskey, like in an old fashioned, it's just, it's a really nice addition to an orange bitter. All right, and then two cardamom pots. All righty. And now for this one, we're going to add one cup of base spirit. So your high proof vodka or whatever other clear spirit that you are using. If you have moonshine, that works also. And then same thing again, just shake it up so it gets incorporated. And then you can let them both sit together for three weeks. And then at the end of the three weeks, you're going to filter it out. And um, especially if you used a fresh orange peel, I recommend a coffee filter because it will get um, a lot of the, the oils out that would be present inside of the um, alcohol. So this, it, these are some bitters that I made a while ago and it's basically like a mole bitter and it has uh, a little bit of jalapeno and some cocoa nibs and a little bit of coffee and um, I can't even remember what else is in there. Oh, some cinnamon stick and so it's, it's like a mole bitter that I made. And yeah, it just threw the coffee filter. Into the jar. And that's what you will do with these guys after three weeks. And after three weeks time, if you taste your bitters and you are like really not feeling like it's orangey enough, or it's not as celery forward as you want it to be, feel free to play with it, you know, like add another celery rib. Maybe your celery rib was smaller than mine and you feel like it needs a little bit more. Go ahead and put it in there, leave it for another week, shake it and see where it comes out. Same with the orange peel, like if you feel like it's not orangey enough or if, if you know, maybe you didn't get as much pith as you feel like you needed to. So it's not as bitter as you think that it should be whenever you taste it at the end of three weeks. Just put more in there and then let it sit for another week, taste it, see how it goes. So yeah, it's, they're super fun. You can do a lot of experimentation with the bitters. There's a lot of leeway with them. Um, it does take some trial and error and it's lengthy trial and error because you know you have to let things sit for a while in order to get them macerated into the alcohol. But um, it's, yeah, they're super fun and, and they make great additions to cocktails. So now we're gonna open it up to any kind of um, questions you guys have about bitters, about the distillery here, about, um, where you know you can maybe find other recipes anything like that great thanks so much kelly you yeah. said it's fairly simple and it is. <laughs> it is it's extremely simple it's an extremely simple process and it and it can be intimidating because i mean like i feel like there's this huge movement right now of 
bitters and specialized bitters and bitter bars and all of that. But I mean, you can make it as complicated as you want to, but really like it's ingredients, quality ingredients will make quality bitters. Excellent. Sort of a mantra for just about anything, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But yeah, we have a lot of questions, so I'll just jump right in. Okay. Will you let us know what the sort of ideal or preferred proof level is for that base spirit? There, um, that is an opinionated question. Um, I know that Erin, who is also here with us on mic, really prefers a high, high proof, and I myself prefer a lower proof because I feel like. Um, it's not as harsh on the end, but Erin, um, do you want to tell us why you prefer a higher proof? So part of the reason that I like to see a higher proof there is uh, a lot of chemistry that goes on in the background, uh, but at a higher proof, you have a lot more of these hydroxyl ions that are going to cling on to a lot of the colloids, which is the, the actual solid flavor particle off of something. So at a higher proof, you're going to pull off a lot more of those base flavors. You're going to need a lot less of the actual bittering agent. Uh, somebody had asked earlier about that, like the chinchona bark or the gentian root. Uh, traditional bittering agents, you won't need as much of that with a higher proof. Also, uh, from uh, the distilling standpoint, if we can get something 180 proof off of the still, I can store twice as much of that as I can something at 90 proof that we use traditionally in bitters. Right. Yeah. And I, and I guess when I use a lower proof, I have just found that um, there is still the bittering agent, but um, just through trial and error, making different bitters, there's more of the subtle flavors come through. Um, it's not as, like so bitter up front, you get more of like the say coriander, like the brightness of the coriander in, the, in a lower um, proof spirit. But we're talking like like 120 proof versus like 180 proof. We're not talking like 80 proof versus 150, you know, we're talking, so everything is higher proof when you're making bitters. It's just a matter of how high. Right, and, and a really easy answer to that commercially would be Everclear. Yep. Right? I mean, you can go down to your local liquor store and get a bottle of corn alcohol, you know, for a couple of bucks for a fifth of it, and that's a really great place to start. Yep. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. And the next question is, what kind of berries did you put in the celery bitters? And I think... Um... All spice berries. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, they're all spice berries. So no fresh berries. No, no fresh berries. No, just some all spice berries. Great. And what size are your jars? These are 12 ounce jars. They're actually what we are serving our to go cocktails in right now. And each one of these will hold um, a double batch of a number of our different cocktails. So they were just the right size for, for the demonstration. <laughs> Great, perfect. And of course, I imagine you could make a half a batch or a double batch. Just exactly, yeah, because obviously, you know, for a, for a home bar, this is gonna make a lot of bitters that are not necessary um, for, you know, just to have at home and, because you're not making like 40 cocktails in a night. I mean, hopefully if you are, you have a lot Hopefully of not. Hopefully not. Unless you have an extremely large family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And roommates. <laughs> yeah, Great. exactly. Um, and just a clarification, do we strain after three weeks? And go ahead. So, with that. so what I would do after three weeks is I would just stick my finger in there and taste it and see if there's like anything that jumps out at you that you need a little bit more of. Um, if there isn't or you're not sure, then strain it out and then try it in a cocktail and then you can always add more ingredients back to it and let it rest longer. Great, perfect. Yeah. Um, I wanna quickly point something out to those of you who are asking questions. Um, throw your question into the Q&A box. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little button that says Q&A. I just don't want to miss it if you put it in the chat. In the chat um, so if yeah. you've already asked a question in the chat, throw it into the Q&A for me so we don't miss it. Awesome. So next question is, in the orange bitters, do you open the cardamom pods? No. <laughs> I didn't. 
a question. No. I'm sorry. I was... Do you open the cardamom pod? No, uh, no, I, I would not recommend that. No. Yeah. Uh, you're going to get you, some you, really funky re flavors. Yeah, really intense. Mm -hmm. Cardamom pods are just intense in general, and which is why, you know, we only use two of them to begin with. But then if they're like cracked or anything, like it's, it's not going to be long. If you wanted to do that, you could throw it in for like two days at the end of the resting point. Okay, cool. Yeah. We want to keep an eye out too. I always know that in my jar, there's always one or two that are kind of split open a little bit. We yeah. don't want to use those. Use the ones yeah, that are don't use those. Just use the closed pods. Perfect. All right. And how, can you tell us again how much orange peel you put in there? Two oranges were like medium sized oranges. It comes out to about 30 grams of dried orange peel. Okay. I know that's, you know, or like a half a cup of dried orange peel. Okay. And a quick note, it, well, I'm going to email all of you after this is over, all of the registrants will get an email next week with a link to the recording of this video. And I will solicit a couple of recipes from Kelly so you can reference oh, definitely. in your own kitchen. So yeah. if, you're, if you're willing to wait, that I mean, we'll talk about the recipes now, but you can yeah. look out for a recipe that you can reference later. Yep. Right. Let's see. Can the celery and I think that the orange bitters recipe is actually on our website already. It's already listed there. So, Perfect. Yeah. Great. Can the celery bitters be used for digestive disorders? And if so, what amount? A quarter teaspoon? Or how might someone use that for that purpose? I, I don't believe that I am liable. Li <laughs> liability wise, I don't think that I could say so to that you know but um i you know really for for my personal use if i was to take something for digestion it would have you know like some ginger in there the celery would be great of course but um turmeric that kind of thing more along those lines for digestion great it's a good question for your naturopath or your physician. Yes, exactly, mm -hmm. or your herbologist. Uh -huh. Yeah, or an herbalist that you know. Yeah, yes, exactly. Okay. Um, so really interesting to know the history of bitters and how that's happening. Yeah, it and, it, and I really, I just, I love herbs in general. Like, the, we have like reishi mushroom extract and like Tulsi basil in our vermouths just because it, it's, not only is the flavor awesome, but just, you know, you can get those flavors from other places, but it's just nice to have, to keep to the roots of, you know, some of the, um, the, the medicinal qualities of bitters. Yeah, I love that. Great. So the next question is if you can use ground cardamom instead of pods. And so I've noticed you're using whole allspice berries, whole whole cardamom pods. Can you talk a little bit about why you want to use the whole spices instead of the ground spices? So in order, in order to create the depth of flavor, the resting period is, is, uh, is pretty important. And with like a ground substance, it's going to draw so much more flavor in that amount of time, but you need that amount of time for say like the bittering agent of the orange peel and the pith. So it's also more difficult to strain out at the end. Um, the whole cardamom pod is just preferred because, um, because for those reasons. Right. And I, I think one thing that I, I'm inclined to add here is that I think there's a little bit of a belief that the stuff on your spice shelf and in your in your jars isn't going to go bad. I really recommend smelling those before you throw them into your bitters because they do get old and musty and the flavor will change. And if I'm not wrong, I'll let Kelly add to this, but you're drawing out all of the flavors from those raw right. ingredients. Right. And so if it smells off at all, I mean, there's a, a very little bit of oil in all of all of these spices and um that can go rancid and so you will be pulling out the rancid flavors <laughs> of your spices if it's not fresh really yeah. bitter bitters <laughs> yes it will be really bitter it will be a little bit funky but i mean you know in the right cocktail it might work out <laughs> I always find that just like a quick sniff of the jar is a pretty good indicator of how fresh what's yeah, in. Definitely. Great. Thank you for that. And how long can you keep bitters? I noticed a couple other people, I'm going to combine some questions. How long do they last and should 
we put them in the refrigerator when they're finished. Refrigeration is not necessary and they will last indefinitely. <laughs> but they will, the, the quality will decline. Yeah, there is a caveat there. And you have to remember too that as alcohol sits, whether it's uh, a whiskey in the shelf or even like these bitters, the alcohol itself does sublimate. So it just goes away. Mm -hmm. And with that, you're gonna see a more condensed flavor profile. So as your alcohol actually evaporates from the solution, you're gonna see those bitters become a lot more pronounced. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, that's super interesting. Um, so another question is if you're gonna lose the taste profile and you just covered basically how it will change the Maybe longer change. Perfect. Could you freeze the orange bitters to help get rid of the oil from fresh peels? It's gonna be really difficult to freeze that. I mean, if you think about like alcohol freezes like minus 280 degrees, uh, it's gonna be really difficult to do that without the help of like liquid nitrogen or something. Well, I think that what they're saying is, can you put it in the freezer and the alcohol doesn't freeze, but all of the oils, the solids oh. will, and then you can filter it through a coffee filter. And yes, that would work. That makes a lot more sense than what I thought. <laughs> yes, yeah. That should work as long as you're, yeah, turning it into solids with the with the freezing process. Yep, and then you can put it through a coffee filter and it will get out more of those oils. Perfect, perfect. It's like a salad dressing yeah. and then like little yeah. disc of oil yeah, to exactly. the top if it's cold. Perfect. Um, I'm gonna come back to a question about the weeded whiskeys. I won't, I won't skip that, um, but I will come back to it. Okay. Um, Someone has noticed your rhubarb mint julep. Someone other than me, because I noticed it right away on the board behind you, <laughs> which sounds fantastic. Um, um, Kristen is wondering about rhubarb bitters. Yes, you can make rhubarb bitters. And would you use essentially the same process you did with the celery? Um, no, because there are, so there are flavors in celery that mimic what's in the mustard seed and the celery seed. So that's why you're using those in the scallion. I wouldn't put any of those in a rhubarb bitter. Um, if I was doing a rhubarb bitter, I would maybe do like a cinnamon stick. I would do some allspice berries. I would maybe even put a little bit of um, coriander and I would do lemon peel as the bittering agent, as the main bittering agent in a rhubarb bitter. To answer your question directly though, Kristen, because it does say uh, rhubarb bitters, we actually use a rhubarb syrup yes. inside that. We, yeah, this is me. It's just, it's rhubarb from the gar from one of our gardens. We all have a lot of rhubarb. And so we make a simple syrup out of it. And basically it's just um, like probably six rhubarb stalks cut up, two cups of sugar, two cups of water, simmer it until the rhubarb falls apart and strain it out. And that's the rhubarb simple syrup that we use in that guy. Great, that sounds delicious. <laughs> <laughs> um, Megan has asked if you would cook the rhubarb for the bitters, but you don't want to do that. Keep it no, away. no, you would want to keep that fresh. Great. Um, this is a good question. Can you talk about the difference between a tincture and bitters? There's not much of a difference. <laughs> It's, they are, one, I mean, like tinctures, tonics, bitters, there, it's a lot of different names for basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, a tincture actually wouldn't be as bitter. So right. traditionally, a tincture doesn't have bittering agents. And by that, we're talking about the barks and the roots uh, of right. the flowering plants. Although it can have the same barks and roots for their medicinal properties right. and still be called a tincture and taste bitter, but not be called a bitter. So it's, <laughs> yeah. Gray line. <laughs> yeah, gray line. Great. Um, Jenna, you asked about the um, ingredients and the recipe for the celery bitters, and we'll send that along in an email um, with, the, with this, a link to this recording, so you can refer back to this. Um, Let's see. So it's, Kim is asking, it's, does it, it sounds like the bittering agents are solely used for flavor. Is that their primary function in this recipe? In, in cocktail bitters recipes, yes. Um, but like we said, you know, bitters have their roots in um, 
medicinal purposes. And so um, there were different aspects of those roots that were that were for maladies in the past. But now, yes, it's just about flavor for cocktails. Great. <laughs> Perfect. And let's see, we covered how long your bitters will last. You don't need to put them in the refrigerator. Um, Jody's wondering how you might use mole bitters since you mentioned mole bitters. Um, so for us, what I would use these in is like, um, like we make an old fashioned with our cactus and float whiskey on top. And I would make like a mole cactus old fashioned and float whiskey on top. That's Perfect. the first thing that comes to mind, but there are a lot of other different things you could do. You could put a little bit in like a, um, in a hot buttered rum and make like an orchard. chai. <laughs> with coconut <laughs> yeah um but yes there are a lot of different things basically you just play around with it but those are two things that come to mind right away great <laughs> thank you <laughs> yeah um, let's see and to go back to this um the semantics a little bit how are bitters different than shrubs so shrubs have a vinegar base um shrubs will have a vinegar base and then whatever else you want to put into them. If it's like golden beet peppercorn or cranberry vanilla. Um, and shrubs don't typically have a bittering agent in them. They um, usually just have ingredients of the flavors that you want. And they're mostly on the sour side because of the vinegar and then also a lot of sweetness. Like there's a lot of sweetener that's put in most shrubs. And in my experience, it seems like you would put a lot less bitters than shrubs into a cocktail. That shrubs more of the half ounce, one ounce piece. Right, than right, exactly. Yep, bitters, we're talking drops at a time. Shrubs, you would put, yep, ounces at a time. Great. Chandler is wondering about gentian root and wormwood, how much you would use if you had it. I am wondering if you can talk to us a little bit about what gentian root is or wormwood and then how you might use um, it. I don't know that much about gentian root and wormwood besides what I use them for. And um, the gentian root we use inside of our house made amaros. And it's basically just to add that, that extra oomph of bitter, bitterness. Um, same with the cinchona bark. It's those two um, ingredients in our Amaro that gives it, you know, like the same thing with like a Campari in a Negroni, like that really super bitter taste that you're left with. That's what we use those for. Um, wormwood is um, same thing, but like almost a different kind of bitterness, I feel like. It's more of an herby bitter and not as much as a bark bitter. And I, and I know that sounds really weird, but, but it's true. <laughs> Um, and so wormwood I use in our vermouth style spirits because it's more herby. Perfect. As far as volumes go, we're talking just a couple of grams per cup. It's, right. it's really potent stuff. Right. So you're and not going to use a whole lot of Especially it. with cinchona bark, if you have any sort of heart um, abnormalities, be very careful with it because it does have quinine in it and you don't want to overdo it. So um, you definitely look into that um, and, and make sure that you're being safe and healthy with the amount that you're putting into something and, and research how much quinine can be drawn out over a long period of time and all of that. Uh, we have access to lab grade equipment and that's how we test our tonic and everything that we use our cinchona bark for. Um, and so we, we know that our quinine level is at a healthy, safe level. So yes, disclaimer on the cinchona bark and quinine content. Excellent. Yeah. Um, let's see, a couple more questions about the alcohol you're putting in there. So would you let it infuse for a shorter amount of time if it's something like Everclear, like a really high proof alcohol or the timing would stay the same? I would definitely start testing it sooner. Right. This is all about your personal preference at this point right. in time. Once you bring this into your kitchen, it's not what Kelly and I like. It's what right. you want to do. But I would definitely start at the two to ten, yeah. two week to ten day time frame and right. figuring out what you want. Perfect. Definitely. Perfect. 
Um, let's see. If you used a super high proof, would you water it down after the infusion is done? I would not, no. <laughs> Use less, maybe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, excellent. The, the other part of that is, in memory, we're looking at drops here, right. like literally drops out of an eydropper yeah. per, I mean, this is going to per last three ounce you. cocktail. So oh, I, I wouldn't worry about it that much. Yeah. And for me, I don't have a lot of experience with bitters. So I, I follow recipes if there are bitters involved. I'm definitely looking at um, a recipe and your bitters jar, if you buy it, will usually come with a little dropper in it. So it makes it nice mm -hmm. and easy to kind of get that quantity right. Yeah, um, definitely. Let's see a few more questions. I love that you all are asking so many questions. Yes, it's awesome. What is the bittering agent in the celery bitters? The seed, the celery seed. Great. Um, do you ever make cherry bitters? Do you have a favorite recipe for cherry bitters? We have not made cherry bitters yet, but we have been thinking about it, especially because cherries um, are coming off here in Colorado right now. So we've been talking about a lot of different other things, uses for cherries and like a cherry shrub or um, cherry bitters. One of the local distilleries here who unfortunately is uh, no longer with us, mm -hmm. they had a fantastic cherry vanilla bitter. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was really, really good. It was paired really well with their gin. Yeah. So yeah. It's definitely a possibility. Yes. Uh, one of the things we do with cherries around here, though, we do like a, ch a cherry basil soda uh, in the summertime for when kids come in. Oh, fun. That sounds delicious. Yes. <laughs> And we've also been, because choke cherries are a native plant here, we have plans of making a choke cherry bitter, and in which case, like, the choke cherry would just be the bittering agent in a choke cherry bitter. Got it. Got it. My favorite thing to do with my surplus of cherries, which I just did about a week ago, is to make brandied cherries for Manhattans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you yeah. want to stay in the cocktail game with your cherries. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Let's see. Yeah. Um, grapefruit bitters, is this something you've ever made? And would you kind of do it similarly to the orange peel? Yes. Yep. Um, I maybe wouldn't put as much clove in a grapefruit, but that would be the only change that I think that I would make to the recipe for grapefruit bitter. Excellent. Um, Heidi's wondering if you ever make any bitters from wild greens like plantains or nettles. No, I haven't yet. This, is, this may be another thing that you want to know a lot about those plants before you start to yeah, do yeah. their elements. It sounds interesting and yeah, I, would, I will look into it now that it's been yeah. mentioned. Yeah, it does sound interesting. Another yeah. herbalist question perhaps. <laughs> um, let's see, a, a few more questions and then um, we'll let you go. What is okay, that good. bitter to pair with bourbon? What's your preferred bitter with bourbon? None. The go-to is orange, I think, personally. Um, but really, I we make a smoky chocolate bitter also that um, the base spirit is our mezcal style spirit. The tails from that is reprocessed and so it is like slightly less smoky than the actual thing. And um, I use that to make a chocolate bitter and that is really good with bourbon. Yeah, that sounds really good. Um, but yes, uh, orange, I mean, orange is just like an obvious go-to for bourbon. Yeah, bourbon and orange are match made in heaven. Um, how about tequila? Tequila, um, we make a citrus bitter that has, um, that has lime and lemon peel in it. And, um, and then also the coriander, but not as much. Um, and nah, I don't think that there's cardamom in those. And, cool. and yeah, a citrus bitter. I feel like the pattern here is that if it pairs well as food, it probably yes. was the bitter. Exactly, but the mole bitters would go really well with like an añejo or a reposado. Yeah, great. Let's see. Um, you have a, do you have a favorite resource for learning more about making bitters and especially for ingredients most home cooks and mixologists might be unfamiliar with? Yes, there is a bitters book. I can't remember who it's by, but there's... Um, 
the one that is literally called yeah. bitters. Yeah, I think yes. it's just called bitters. And it's a great frame of reference. And I mean, you can tweak the the recipes in there, but it's it's a great book. There's another one by Death & Co. Uh, yes. That's a really fantastic resource mm -hmm. for spirits in general, but their understanding of why flavors go together is really, really great. Mm -hmm. And they do a great explanation of which bitters go with which spirits. Right. And, and, and if you're interested in like cocktail development, just looking up like a flavor star chart and like what mm -hmm. kind of flavors, like if you have these two flavors, what else might um, balance the cocktail more is really interesting. You can use that obviously in like home cooking um, the same way, but it, it definitely correlates to cocktail development as well. Great. That's great. And Megan threw out that um, the bitters book is by Brad Thomas Parsons. In case you want to look it up, order that for your home. And then um, two last questions. One, Jenna has noticed that the label on your Angostura bitters is oversized. Is there a reason for that? Wait. No, no, no not, on, not on our Angostura oh. bitters, just in general, the, the royal oh. Oh. Um, oh, so oh, it's really like, funny. I actually just read that not too long ago. So initially it was to cover up uh, any fill variants in the bottles prior to them being regulated by the mm -hmm. FDA. And then secondly, it became as uh, packaging, being, packaging became more automated. It's much more easy for automation to take an entire roll and then it is to have like a separate front and a back label. And so then they just kind of stuck with that. Right. I literally read that within the last two weeks. Awesome. Perfect. I was thinking about yours too. And I thought, yeah, I was like, I don't think, I don't think we have any here, but we do make a house bitter that's in the same vein. As have, the same I have the same, same, bitter. same thing. I'm always on the top. Like, there's so much extra here. Why is this thing so huge? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Question. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Awesome. One last question is going to take us a little bit away from the bitters, but is uh, maybe a really fun way to talk about some of your, some of what Dryland makes, which is, Al said, you said there were two weeded whiskeys and wants to, is interested in what the difference is between them. And so um, I think this is a really interesting look at, at the Dryland products and. Yeah, definitely. Well, so uh, first I'm going to start off in saying that it, uh, there's a slight misspeak there. They're not actually wheated whiskeys. They are actually 100% wheat whiskeys. Wheat whiskeys. Yeah. Uh, so the difference being that there's no other grain in it. There's no barley, there's no corn. Uh, the two differences are, the first one we have is an heirloom variety. So it's uh, about a 3,000 year old grain, untouched, you know, besides, you know, natural pollination. Uh, it's a very wonderful grain. It comes off in, in a spirit form, very soft and smooth. Uh, really low heat index, kind of hits you in the back of the throat really late in the drink, uh, comes off as kind of caramel into vanilla. Uh, the other one is a more modern variety. It was designed by the Colorado State University Department of Agriculture in the late 70s, early 80s, and it's called Antero. And it was specifically designed uh, for Colorado's dry climate and to produce a lot of sugar as a cereal grain. And because of that, it comes off as a more modern day sipping whiskey. It's really hot up front, nice and smooth in the middle, has these great black cherry notes on the end of it. So both of those are, are natural uh, Colorado products, uh, both of them unirrigated from the local area. And it's a fun way for us to represent two totally different grains uh, in, in what you're going to see after we're done processing them. Uh, they're treated the exact same way, but the flavor profile is really shockingly different. Yep. Yeah, I would say the Antero drinks almost more like a rye because it has a little bit of spice to it all, as well. Excellent. And in our last session with you, we showed a gorgeous video where you, know, I, you can find it online. We'll put it in the email and you can learn yeah. a little bit more about the dryland process and why dryland is making the choice to use just wheat. And even though it's a more challenging choice, so I encourage you to get on their website and learn more about Dryland. Um, these guys are really doing slow, slow liquor over there. And it's a really beautiful process. And the way you are using the products around you is um, commendable and delicious. I'm lucky enough to have a bottle of cactus in my home. I've been enjoying it immensely. So I just threw the URL for the Dryland website. And I encourage you to go learn more about Dryland and what they're offering and what they're making. And with that, Kelly, unless there's anything else you want to add here, we're so grateful for your time. This has been so interesting. I can't wait to try it. <laughs>
Yeah. Yep. Thank you guys for having me. Um, and yeah, if you guys have any more questions or concerns, I mean, definitely feel free to, to just drop us an email at the website and we're more than happy to answer anything that you have going on during your process over the next few weeks of making bitters. Perfect. Thanks so much. Thanks for joining us today. Look out for that email in your inbox sometimes towards the end of next week, I think. And have a wonderful weekend. Thanks to the Dryland team. Thanks so much, Giselle.